Welcome everyone, this is Dr. Mercola, and today I'm here with Dr. Hunting Hockey, who has been working, it was an expert in vitamin C. He's a physician, has personally supervised over 60,000 intravenous vitamin C administrations, and really, it's just actually, we were fortunate to find him because he just came back from a, a conference that he sponsored in Japan on vitamin C. So he's really, truly is an international expert in this in this area, and I'm just delighted that he's able to spend some time with us today and really enlighten us about really an important modality that really with the advent of many of these newer antioxidants and such, I think it's somewhat taken a back seat, but certainly vitamin C is the grandfather of of the an- traditional antioxidants that we know of. So welcome uh, to our call today. Thank you, Joe. Can you uh, give us a bit of a background of your professional history, how you got interested in vitamin C and, and you know how your journey in that process has occurred and what you're doing with it now? Well, I, uh, I'm a family physician, and I've always been interested in health and wellness. And uh, about 22 years ago, joined Dr. Hugh Reardon, who, uh, uh, after uh, Linus Pauling and Ewan Cameron did the initial research on IV vitamin C for cancer patients, the, uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, reportedly replicated their study. Of course, they did not give it intravenously. They just gave oral vitamin C, and they were not able to get the outstanding results that Pauling and Cameron got in their, in their study on cancer patients. And so uh, there was a long controversy, and then Pauling died. And so Dr. Reardon pretty much took up the, the flag and uh, carried on a 15-year uh, research project called RECNAC, which is cancer spelled backwards. And he was able to do some of the initial groundbreaking research in cell culture showing that vitamin C was selectively cytotoxic against cancer cells. And so we then uh, embarked upon a whole series of uh, uh, patients who had either stage 3 or stage 4 cancer, and IV vitamin C was found to be very beneficial. Now, it's not considered a standalone therapy for cancer, but it's a perfect adjunct to any kind of therapy that the uh, cancer patient is receiving at this time, and it will reduce side effects and improve quality of life. And there's actually been two major studies now showing how it improves quality of life. Interesting. I hadn't realized that you really have taken up the, the banner that Dr. Pauling started, who's well recognized as really the leader and the innovator and founder of the interest in vitamin C, ascorbic acid, and uh, that you really followed in his footsteps. So um, now, Doctor, with Dr. Pauling's work, he's really known for the two, two points, which is really the treatment of cancer, but also the treatment of infectious diseases, specifically viral upper respiratory infections. So do you, do you, in your work, do you, are you primarily focusing on the use for a, a cancer adjuvant, or do you also use it for infections? We use it uh, for just about everything. Uh, certainly anyone that's got a cold or a flu or chronic fatigue or any chronic viral infection, we we do use that. Our, 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 we had our first Reardon IVC in cancer symposium last year, and Dr. Tom Levy was our, was our keynote speaker. And, of course, Dr. Levy wrote Curing the Incurable, which is a fantastic book about vitamin C, infectious disease, and, and toxin control. And so certainly uh, IV vitamin C works very well for infectious diseases as, as well as cancer. Yeah, we just recently posted an article in our newsletter uh, that of a, of a uh, something that received quite a bit of notoriety last year with the swine flu epidemic of, of an individual, uh, I believe in Australia or New Zealand, who came down with terminal swine flu, was uh, diagnosed and really given a few days or weeks to live, and uh, I think actually contacted Dr. Levy and uh, was given the administration IV uh, of vitamin C and actually recovered from it quite nicely. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely a, uh, a very underutilized modality in infectious disease. It's 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 really a premier treatment for any chronic infection, but again, it's not typically recognized by conventional medicine. Now, the vast majority of the people watching this or listening to this are not physicians, and there's really two different ways that you can, two primary ways you can administer vitamin C. One is orally, and the other is intravenously. So, uh, obviously, uses a lot of intravenous. And if you're using the intravenous approach, you really have to be a healthcare clinician and, and licensed in some way to, to to be trained and then certified to be able to do that. 
So uh, maybe you can expand on those just different approaches for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, for the average patient, I'm I'm certainly going to encourage them to continue taking at least the Linus Pauling dose, which is a one gram twice a day of vitamin C. Uh, certainly, uh, you can do more than that. And if you're if you're suffering from chronic uh, infections or chronic fatigue, you can you can go ahead and gradually increase your dose up to. Uh, what's called the bowel tolerance dose, and it's very safe. Uh, the whole idea that vitamin C causes kidney stones, we have completely disproven that. I've often told patients if that were true, we would be the kidney stone capital of the world here in Wichita, Kansas, for as many IVCs as we give and as much vitamin C as we recommend. But there's been several studies by urologists that have shown that that is just simply not uh, an issue with uh, high-dose vitamin C. So uh, for the typical patient, oral is fine, but if, you're, if you really have a serious illness, you should think in terms of doing intravenous vitamin C from a practitioner because it can greatly amplify and change the benefits of IV vitamin C. Interesting. And what, the, what are the typical doses you find in intravenous vitamin C that, that are well, administered? We have uh, I just my my talk over in Japan last week was the Reardon IVC protocol, and in that protocol we recommend a patient who's never had vitamin C intravenously. First of all, we 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 recommend that people get a G6PD level, and the reason for this is uh, that's an enzyme that the red blood cells need to maintain the integrity of their membranes and. What people don't understand is that high-dose intravenous vitamin C is a strong pro-oxidant. And a pro-oxidant in a G6PD deficient patient can cause hemolysis of their red blood cells. And so using IV vitamin C is not for just the novice. I think you should, you should be going to an experienced practitioner who is using at least the, the Reardon protocol or some kind of uh, protocol that's going to make sure that they use the the vitamin C intravenously in a safe manner. But this G6PD deficiency is relatively uncommon. It's relatively uncommon and quite it's frankly... It's not something like every other person has, right? No, it's it, you're talking more about Mediterranean descent, African descent uh, uh, patients. And, and even then, it's pretty rare. I would say... We did a series of over 800 G6PDs, and we only saw four deficiencies. Okay. And of those four, we were able to give 15 gram IV vitamin C. However, I do have knowledge that there have been practitioners who've given a 15 gram IV vitamin C, and the patient did experience hemolysis. And so, from a medical legal perspective, it's it's best to do a G6PD before embarking upon okay. so high probably IV less vitamin C. So in your experience, less than one person in 200, which is – so the odds are you're not going to have it. But, you know, right. to be to be comprehensive, you really need to do that. Yeah. Now, the, the doses that you're using is about 15 grams. You ever go That's higher, 25, 100? Yeah. yeah, what we found, what the Reardon uh, research found was that uh, a blood level of around 300, 350 was necessary to have this selective cytotoxicity. Now, since then, we've – probably geared that down a little bit, maybe as even as much as 250 milligrams per deciliter is going to be sufficient to, to have an anti-cancer effect. Now, just to put that into perspective for the average person, uh, if we were to measure someone off the street, their blood level would be about one milligram per deciliter if they're eating a fairly decent diet. If they're less than 0.6 milliliter milligrams per deciliter they're into a, a scurvy type range of, of vitamin c but what we're talking about for a post ivc saturation level giving let's say 25 to 50 grams of vitamin c iv over about a 90 minute period is something in the 200 to 300 milligram per deciliter range so we're talking about 200 to 300 times the normal amount of vitamin c that your blood normally experiences just eating a uh, balanced diet. And these h extraordinarily high types of levels are really mostly indicated for the treatment of cancers and infectious diseases. Is that correct? That's right, because when you get into these, as you say, extraordinarily high blood levels, what happens is vitamin C, which will always be an antioxidant, 
nevertheless starts to have a pro-oxidant effect. Uh, and this has been documented at NIH in two studies. Matter of fact, at our, at our second annual Reardon IBC and Cancer Conference, we had Dr. K. H. Chen, who was the author, along with Mark Levine, on, uh, on high-dose vitamin C as a uh, source for creating hydrogen peroxide in the extracellular space surrounding tumor cells, and it's thought that it's the uh, it's this hydrogen peroxide or pro-oxidant effect of vitamin C that's actually having the anti-tumor property, as well as it's it's that same uh, pro-oxidant effect that's helping uh, infect helping the body get rid of infectious disease. So, in your experience in using it for these conditions. Uh, what are some of the more dramatic examples that you've seen over the last 20 years? I mean, you've, you've, as you mentioned earlier, you've given over 60,000 doses of, of IV vitamin C. So I'm sure in over 20 years you've seen, you know, quite a few dramatic recoveries. Because if you, you know, there's no way you'd be still be doing this over two decades if it wasn't effective. Yeah, Dr. Reardon's very first case was a, a stage four uh, renal cell cancer that had metastasized to the lungs. And the, basically, the oncologist had said, there's nothing else we could do. Go ahead and get your things in order. And that's when uh, the, the patient had read about uh, Linus Pauling's research. And so he came to Dr. Reardon, and Dr. Reardon went ahead and started giving him, uh, started out with the 15 grams, but he moved him up to 30 grams twice a week. And after two years, actually, it was after one year, the metastases were completely gone. He, the, the oncologist called him up and asked him what had, what had he done because he had never seen a stage four cancer go into remission. And we've actually had very good success with renal cell, uh, bladder cancers, and uh, lymphomas. Those, those three, those, those types have been very effectively treated with IV vitamin C. Okay, now, um... I just want to go back to a basic supposition and, and really address many of the skeptics who will be viewing this and say, I don't believe you. Well, you know, Dr. Linus Pauling uh, actually won two Nobel Prizes. Uh, one was in science and one was for peace, but he really should have won three because he really almost won the Nobel Prize for discovering the DNA. So he should have had three. That's right. I mean, he yep. really was a brilliant man. And he wrote the book about vitamin C and he was just castigated in the public. And, and there are many people, scientists, who kind of used a variety of ammunition to discount what he said, even though he was clearly a genius. So I'm wondering, and, and then if you could comment on why this approach hasn't been adopted. You know, I mean, you've been getting some success. Why hasn't conventional medicine caught on to this? Why aren't they using it more? I mean, what, what, what is the what is the comp, what what is the limitation? The the uh, the confounding variables that's preventing people or physicians and clinicians and researchers from adopting this more widely. Well, I'm sure there's several factors here. Number one, um, most people think of vitamin C as it's a vitamin, and, and you define vitamin as a trace amount of, of a substance that you need to prevent scurvy, for instance, in, in vitamin C's sake. But what we're talking about here is something in a pharmacologic range. And the way to really understand vitamin C is to go back to the writings of Irwin Stone, who wrote uh, The Healing Factor, which was a fantastic book written in the 70s about uh, vitamin C. And he points out that every creature, when they are sick, um, they greatly increase their, their liver or their kidneys production of vitamin C. Now, humans, primates, and guinea pigs have lost that ability. We, we lack the, that we still have the gene that makes the L-glonolactone uh, oxidase enzyme that converts glucose to vitamin C, but it's non-functional. So we are, we have to get our vitamin C from the outside. We have to get it as food. But it, when we give it IV, in a sense, what we're doing is recreating the liver's ability to synthesize tremendous amounts of vitamin C. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how much humans can synthesize. I do know goats, when they are severely injured, can take what would would be a normal synthesis of uh, of about 2,000 milligrams per day if you were comparing uh, their weight to an adult um, human. It'd be about two grams a day when they're well, 
up to as high as 18 to 20 grams a day when they're sick, severely sick or injured or infected or stressed. And so, so I always look upon high dose vitamin C as nature's way of dealing with uh, crisis in, in terms of one's health. And so this notion, however, does not exist in the conventional thinking, in the medical mind. And, and my son, who's a second year medical student, has had very little, if any, uh, discussion of nutritional therapies. The only reason he knows he's had a little bit is because one of Dr. Reardon's students, Dr. Jeannie Drisco, who is also doing IV vitamin C research, is at the University of Kansas. And uh, there are more people aware of, the, of, of utilizing, utilizing IV vitamin C for cancer there probably than any other medical school in the country. And so he has heard of it in his medical training. But other than that, there's no other nutritional uh, training that he's gotten so far. So it's just, I guess, this lack of appreciation that, that humans uh, have lost the ability to make vitamin C. And, and if we had that ability, like many animals do, we would generate really high levels under certain conditions where we were exposed to these stressors that required a benefit from the vitamin C. So right, is, is that, right. that's the primary reason. It's just this. Well, and also, I mean, uh, you know, there, there are other factors involved here. Uh, there are financial factors. I mean, you know, the, uh, the standard oncology treatments are extremely expensive. And, uh, you know, IV, IV vitamin C, relatively speaking, is very inexpensive. And so the, the notion that something that is uh, non-toxic uh, and that that you know has uh, there's there's no FDA indication for IV vitamin C, so oncologists are reluctant to use what they consider to be a kind of a pop culture type of approach to cancer because of, again you know cancer is a life threatening disease. But what they forget is that most cancer patients are are depressed, they're in pain, they have uh, tremendous fatigue. And, uh, and, de and depression, and these are all signs of scurvy. And if you actually measure vitamin C levels in cancer patients, especially advanced cancer patients, they're all below that 0.6 milligrams per deciliter level that I was uh, talking about. And so one of the, the things that IV vitamin C does is that it immediately relieves their scurvy symptoms. And so they start having a greater sense of well-being. Their pain, le they don't need as much uh, pain medicine. Their appetite improves. Their mood improves. They they have a, be, a better quality of life. And this this uh, was recently replicated in a Japanese study that was reported on over in Japan at this symposium that I was at. That cancer patients who get IV vitamin C improve quality of life in all the various uh, statistical measures that you can look at. Okay, so it sounds like another component that you know really is somewhat obvious if you think about it is the economics of the situation too. Right. And that you know oral vitamin C is really inexpensive, but it's very few people are be able to go over 10 grams due to bowel tolerance issues, maybe 20 at the most. But you know, so that's going to cost a few dollars. But even IV vitamin C is, C is relatively inexpensive. I mean, when you consider the cost of the traditional oncology patient, when and I don't see those patients, and you do, and you could perhaps give us a better idea, but my understanding is that we are talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in, 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 in typically, typically, I mean, many of these medications yeah. are tens of thousands of dollars a month uh, to right. give to these patients, and that's a massive industry, so there's, there's all these incentives to perpetuate that type of, type of process or, or, or intervention because all this is, there's massive amounts of profits to be made from people promoting that. Where that's right. No one's making money from vitamin C. That's so, right. That's, that's sort of an option. Awesome. The way we're trying to position IV vitamin C is that it's a it's an excellent adjunct. And and uh, Dr. Chen uh, presented two weeks ago at our symposium, and she presented amazing research showing that in pancreatic cancer patients, uh, if you give them just Gemzar alone, which is one of the standards of therapy there. Uh, there's, there is a slight improvement, but not, nothing very dramatic. Uh, vitamin C alone will show a significant improvement in pancreatic cancer cells in terms of uh, knocking out tumor cells. But if you combine the two, vitamin C and GEMSAR together, there is a clear synergistic benefit to the two together. 
as well as if, if they gave it to patients, which we know we had a, a pancreatic cancer patient survive two and a half years doing IV vitamin C. And the typical survival time of a, of a standard pancreatic cancer is three to six months at best. Probably and so, three. <laughs> For yeah, three is more, more typical uh, if they're lucky. And so, uh, plus the IV vitamin C greatly improves quality of life, reduces side effects from chemotherapy, and does not, I repeat, does not interfere with chemotherapeutic uh, agents, even though that is a common misunderstanding. And that's another reason why oncologists do not normally recommend vitamin C, is they have this idea that the antioxidant effect of it's going to interfere with radiation or chemotherapy. All right, I'd like to transition into more of the typical consumer questions that we have, because most of this is really more for professional. But on the other hand, one in two, between one and two and one in three people viewing this are going to be either themselves personally or know someone who has cancer. So it's not a, an insignificant question. And, and really understanding that this could be a very helpful therapeutic modality is, is important to know. So if someone has been inspired and curious to integrate this into either their own cancer program or someone they know or one of their family members, what would you suggest to them to do to acquire more information so they can implement this type of program? Well, we, we actually have the Reardon IVC protocol on our website at reardonclinic.org. And so they could, they could go there. And plus, we've got all of our research articles on that same website so they can start looking at the research. Uh, I've done a, uh, a video on how vitamin C fights cancer at healthhunteronline.org. That's very good. And, this, and that, Dr. That's, that's spelled just the way it sounds, sounds health hunter? healthhunteronline.org okay. and okay. click on free video and they can watch uh, a really a very detailed explanation of how high dose vitamin C has a pro-oxidant effect and can be very beneficial in treating the cancer patient. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that because I'm sure many people are going to be interested in integrating And it. at that same website, Dr. Glenn Hyland, who was an oncologist, has been consulting here at our clinic for several years did a very nice lecture entitled uh, IVC chemotherapy and radiation, are they compatible? And he does a compelling job of showing that not only are they compatible, but they are synergistic. Great, well that's awesome. So thank you for compiling that and offering those resources. That will be very helpful. So with res I'd like to focus more to the oral version and what many people do, because there's a, it's probably one of the most common supplements that people are using is vitamin C. Now, as, we, as you alluded to, many times you, you're just simply unable to leave the, achieve the high levels in the blood that's necessary when you take oral. But there's a new version that I actually learned about first from Dr. Thomas Levy, who's clearly one of the leaders in this area, and that is liposomal vitamin C. And I wonder if you can address that because his experience to me is that uh, you tend to bypass many of the complications of the traditional vitamin C or ascorbic acid and are able to achieve far higher intracellular concentrations that in his case, it, you know, seem to be comparable to the effects of intravenous vitamin C. Yeah, I've talked to Tom about this at quite some length and, and as of yet, I don't see the proof yet. I went ahead and got uh, a case of liposomal vitamin C myself and, and took my dose up to 34 grams a day using it. And, and one thing I can tell you is that it's amazingly well tolerated. Mm -hmm. and, but it does not raise the blood level all that much. And I've talked to Tom about this, and he says, well, it may not raise the blood level that much, but it does not require the glute transporter to get the vitamin C into the cell, so it just passes right on in, intracellularly. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of people trying this, and I think it can be used as an Interesting. adjunct to IV vitamin C, because you, most people are only going to do IV vitamin C once or twice a week. Yes. And so yes. so by doing the liposomal vitamin C, they can they can easily do six grams of liposomal vitamin C orally without a bit of gastrointestinal distress. Yeah, it's uh it's interesting to hear your feedback on it. It's uh certainly more convenient and you know, not many of us are going to want to enjoy having our a needle inserted into one of our veins twice a week. And uh, you know, by the ascorbic acid can be relatively uh, damaging to the veins. I mean, there's no question. So it's it's definitely no, that's not true. No, but, but that's not, not true. That, I mean, irritating is what I meant to say. My, 
I've given my wife uh, over 350 IV vitamin C infusions because she had breast cancer about 12 years ago. And I've used the same vein for, for over 12 years without any difficulty. So you have to make sure that the company that you're getting your vitamin C from has po properly buffered it. If ascorbic acid, if it was an acid type of uh, substance, which it could be if they do not buffer it properly, then yes, you could get some damage to the endothelium of the veins. Okay. So. Well, just to finish up the discussion on liposomal, because I didn't really mention what that is for our viewers who have not been exposed to it before, but essentially it's something like an egg yolk where you have this phosphate bond that's that's attached to the vitamin C, and because of that, you get much better absorption, so that's why you tend not to see the diarrhea that you normally would, because it's not in the gut causing this osmotic diarrhea. So, you know, that's one reason, but, you know, the, the thought is that once attached to this phosphate, it just really bypass, goes straight from the blood into the cell, so that's why you may not see the higher blood values that you did seek to objectively document, but it's interesting to know because you're clearly one of the leaders in the field. Uh, from uh, from your perspective, it's still somewhat unproven, but certainly not dangerous. Uh, oh, no, I would recommend it. Uh, there are other forms of uh, vitamin C out there now that uh, that are, uh, they're, they're like, they're new forms of sodium ascorbate that are buffered that can be, I, like I take 12 grams every day first thing in the morning and I have no no uh, uh, GI upset so part of it too you have to kind of get your gut in shape to vitamin C and so not everyone needs to take that amount but high doses of vitamin C does improve your immune system it supports adrenal function uh, it's definitely in, can improve uh, endorphin levels so there's a lot of benefits to vitamin C just to general health well, I wonder if you can comment now on some of the specifics of the oral forms that are available. There are a number of people, primarily with a naturopathic perspective, who believe that it's not just the pure vitamin C, the ascorbic acid, but it's the combination of the ascorbic acid with its associated micronutrients that one would find in nature, all the, like the bioflavonoids and all the other components. And it's a synergy taken together that's more effective. Now. Well, there's, there's, no, there's no question that would be a better way to go. I mean, anytime you can do more like food, you're, you're going to be better off. And I, th and I think people sometimes get the mis mistaken understanding that supplements are better than food. But I think food is still the essential thing that your body needs in order to get optimal cellular functioning. But when you're sick, uh, uh, you can use uh, trace nutrients in orthomolecular doses to achieve effects that you can't get from just food alone. So, uh, but 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 in general, for people who are healthy, who are wanting to stay healthy, I would recommend using uh, vitamin C that's got bioflavonoids and other cofactors associated with it. Okay. Uh, do you have any specific favorites that you like, or any comp specific bioflavonoid combinations that you have found useful over the years? Well, uh, not 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 in. Not none that I can specifically think of. I mean, I just tell people to eat a really good whole foods, colorful diet, and you're going to get a lot of bioflavonoids that way and carotenoids. Uh, the more colors, the better, and and that's where you get the phytonutrient synergism that can be very effective in in maintaining health and keeping the cell in a balanced state of redox. Now, one of the other oh uses of vitamin C, and I want to talk about some of the conditions that you found helpful aside from infections and cancer, would be the uh, indication of bruising or easy bruisability, capillary fragility. And uh, typically it's not just vitamin C, it's the associated bioflavonoids that are useful there. And, and uh, one of the other conditions and side effects you can have if you uh, have this tendency is you could actually be far more easily predisposed to hemorrhoids because that, that's uh, yeah. you know, sort of a complication. So they go hand in hand. If you have easy bruising, you're likely going to have an external and internal hemorrhoid. So uh, what, what have you found to be useful for this uh, therapeutically? Well, I just, once again, I, 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 be, I think we probably put every patient that we see on vitamin C. And, and I myself in medical school had trouble with hemorrhoids. And until I uh, actually got on vitamin C, I would have bleeding hemorrhoids and bleeding gums. So the top and bottom were bleeding. So that tells you that I was vitamin C deficient all through medical school and through the early years of my practice. But in the last 20 years, I, my gums don't bleed and I don't have hemorrhoids and I take a lot of vitamin C. Uh, you take so I, I really, you take the bioflavonoids too, or uh, 
let's see there i i, I take yeah I, I take grapefruit seed or grape seed extract regularly and i i usually take quercetin uh but i don't take a i don't take a bioflavonoid mix per se it would probably be, probably be a good idea but i don't well, take that I, i'm uh you know when i reviewed this for a friend who had this problem uh i found that rutin seemed to be particularly yeah rutin would be i agree that would be well, excellent yeah, and and rutin by itself and not not to diminish the importance of the need for vitamin c but rutin by itself I think can can reverse the bruising and the the tendency towards hemorrhoids. So it's just a little yeah. hint that I learned. It seemed to work well for the the person I recommended it to. Now there, there's an interesting thing about dosing. Uh, you know, Mark Levine uh, published a study where he basically said that it does. You know, there's no need to take any more than about 220 milligrams a day uh, vitamin C because you're just going to it's just going to go out. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Steve Hickey, who has written a book called Ascorbate, has shown that if you take vitamin C frequently throughout the day, you can achieve much higher plasma levels. Uh, uh, so even though the kidneys will, will tend to rapidly excrete the vitamin C, if you're dosing it every hour or two, you can uh, maintain a much higher plasma level than if you just dose it once a day, right. unless you have an extended release form of uh, vitamin C. Okay, so that's a good point. It kind of leads me to one of my next questions, which because we have many people who wrote in asking about this, which is ester C. And I'm sure you've got some some views on that. So if you can share that with us. We'd yeah, it's a buffered form of vitamin C. And generally, a lot of people who can't tolerate vitamin C, they really can't tolerate ascorbic acid. The ascorbic acid tends to, to disrupt their gut in such a way that they get gastrointestinal distress. Uh, ester C is better tolerated because it is buffered, and it seems to be that the uh, that the, the the vitamin C derivatives that are used to make that stay in the bloodstream longer than just straight ascorbic acid. Well, I, I had some concerns about ester C, and, and perhaps you can address them. Um, and just for a basis of understanding for our listeners and viewers is that vitamin C is an antioxidant because it's an electron donor and it only is doing that if it's in the reduced state. If it's in the oxidized state, it doesn't really work well. And there's, there's, there's uh, rejuvenators like coenzyme Q10 in the system that will re-oxidize re it or re reduce, reduce it so they can, it can donate electrons again. But uh, my understanding is that most of the ester C is oxidized and, and not as beneficial. But I'm wondering what your experience has been. Well, there was a study uh, at Sloan Kettering uh, a couple years ago looking at the effects of dehydroascorbic acid on cancer cells, and it was it was a negative study. And uh, basically, I to me it was a big duh. I mean, I would not use an oxidized form of vitamin C. Now, the the idea that ester C is an oxidized form of vitamin C is new information to me. I did not know that. Yeah, that was so, my. That's why I've always avoided it and discourage people from using it. So, you know, and that could be mistaken, but that's my current understanding. Uh, well, I would not recommend using oxidized form of vitamin C, much in the same way uh, with uh, CoQ10, the new ubiquinol, which is the reduced form, appears to be more effective at the cellular level than the oxidized form, unless you're a young person and have a really active uh, ability to regenerate your, your ox antioxidants. So. So yeah, it's all. It's a, sometimes the devil's in the details. There's no no question. Yeah, no question about that. So, do you find uh, are there any ages or or concern, concerns with ages giving vitamin C? Like, do you, would you give it to a newborn or an infant? Uh, obviously, it would be not a, an oral version, something they would chew or swallow or, or drink. No, no. Dr. Klinner, who was a pioneer in uh, vitamin C, used to give his pregnant mothers three to six grams a day, and and so my daughter who who just had our first grandchild about 14 months ago, she took, I think she took four or five grams a day and had a very easy delivery and, and she's continued to give her daughter, uh, uh, you know, at least uh, 250 to 500 milligrams per day. I would strongly encourage it. You know, uh, most pediatricians accept the fact that babies will have eight to 10 upper respiratory infections in the first year of life. Well, that's true if they are low in vitamin C, but if you give them adequate vitamin C and vitamin D and a couple of these other nutrients, the kids just don't get sick 
and this has been true for our granddaughter. She's been in a daycare setting and has she's been the only one that's, I think she's had one upper respiratory infection in 14 months. Yeah, I might add that uh, there's probably a powerful synergy with which is the, the new craze vitamin, which is vitamin D, and thankfully it's gotten more recognition. Really, it, it, it truly is not a vitamin, of course, because vitamin is, is really reserved for the terms that we can right. only get from the, our diet, and, and we can clearly get vitamin D from exposing our skin to sunshine, a proper amount of sunshine. So, right. Um, but but vitamin D has many similar benefits, and when you combine that with therapeutic levels of D and vitamin C, you know you really make it very difficult to get sick. Yeah, which is a, which I've had many many patients in the last year say they've been through the winter months without getting ill, and I it's been over two and knock on wood it's been over two years since I've had a respiratory infection. Yeah, you know, and it just as another, an aside, but I think an important comment, and, and certainly I'd like your, you to address this too, because you have a lot more experience in this, which your focus on cancer, but it's my personal belief that if you have a proper lifestyle, you avoid most of the toxins, you know, are exercising properly, you have optimized vitamin D levels, optimized vitamin C levels, or taking regular amounts of it, and, and really pretty much eating a healthy diet, staying away from the bad stuff, that processed foods and other components that it's very, very unlikely you're going to get down. You're going to come down with cancer. That you essentially, by following this type of lifestyle, you immunize yourself against well over ninety percent, maybe over ninety-five percent of potential malignancies. In the symposium that I just came from, we we and 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 uh, the one we had two weeks ago, we talked a lot about cancer being the non-healing wound, and this is uh, a new concept and what cancer is and most people think of cancer as something from the outside that has taking o taking over the body and uh, kind of the invasion of the body snatcher type thing but in reality it appears that cancer is the uh, a maladaptive response to sustained injury and if you take any area of the body and, and injure it with toxins radiation, you name it, uh, and and the body attempts to heal that wound but runs out of healing resources, then that wound will start to turn cancerous. The non-healing wound will start to turn cancerous, and it turns out that cancer may itself be the healing process uh, maladapting to a nutrient deficient situation. Well, that, I so, love that perspective. So what, what, what level of immunity do you think it would provide if you had an optimized lifestyle? I mean, well, how much do you think it would reduce your risk of anything? I know it's just a guess, but you know, your, your guess is better than mine because you see this all the time. Well, you know, uh, uh, Roger Williams, Dr. Roger Williams, the great nutritional, uh, nutritionist researcher, basically said that the environment of the cell can always be improved, which means that any of us, all of us, could do a little bit better at any given time. But if you're really working from an optimal state where you've got all your nutrient levels optimized, you've got your toxic levels reduced as much as possible, you're getting exercise and sleep and, and, uh, and, I, and, and just coming from Japan, uh, uh, there's a term that I learned called ikigaya, I-K-I-G-A-I. -I -I. Ikigaya means your purpose for living. If you've got a strong ikigaya, I don't think you're going to be nearly as likely to get cancer as someone who's malnourished, leading a absurd existence, not getting enough sleep, exposing themselves to toxins. A lot of our toxins are self-exposed toxins. I think th those people are going to be at a much higher risk for cancer compared to someone who's taking good care of themselves. Well, just, that's what I was trying to get num number-wise. Do you think it might be as much as a 90% reduction in the likelihood? Because it's all a matter of... I, 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 I would like to think so. I mean, I, I know my whole reason for being in this field is so I could learn how to take better care of myself and my family. And I'm, I'm not planning on getting cancer, but, you know, I, I do see patients who think they're doing everything right and they still get cancer. So I, I, that's why we do encourage nutrient testing and various ways to assess your, your, your state because you, you do need reality checks because yes. sometimes people think they're doing good, but they're not doing as good as... Well, and they, another common reality check that is really, there's virtually no way to know, you can't perceive this, is your vitamin D level. 
And we know right. that you've got to do blood levels on that. There's just Absolutely. you just don't know. And and even though you think you're taking swallowing enough, even maybe five thousand units, there are people that I've seen, I'm sure you've seen too, who need twenty, thirty thousand units a day. Uh, right. or two hours of exposure to sunshine or a combination of something. So you got to get up there. And if you're treating cancer, you probably want to get closer to 80 to 100 uh, nanograms per milliliter to, 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 to treat that effectively rather than the 50. So it's a very powerful thing. And, I would, and yeah. I'm glad you brought up I that point. That. And, and that's I, where, you know, Dr. Reardon, my boss, who started our clinic, uh, he basically said the, the big missing piece in nutritional medicine was the use of the lab to verify optimal levels yeah. if you if you if you now not everyone's going to have the resources to do that but if you can periodically get tested that's going to give you i mean I, to me that's at, that's probably one of your best way I, I look upon nutrient levels as kind of tumor markers if you if you've got good nutrient if you've got a very good vitamin d level that's as good as having a low tumor marker yeah, and I'm, let me just go off on another little tangent here because I mentioned the vitamin D level, but you know, during my lectures, right, there's the, there's a few other simple tests that can be done. That is to check for iron or ferritin, and yeah. ideally yeah. should be between 20 and 80 because I'm sure you've seen and, and experienced what I have is as many as 20 percent of the people out there have elevated iron levels, which will right. increase your that's, risk of cancer. That's and, exactly. Right. And you don't need to take a supplement for it. All you need to do is donate your blood. It's the most effective way of therapeutic phlebotomy. And you can radically reduce and eliminate that, that risk factor. So a ferritin level. Insulin level, that tells you if your diet is appropriate. If you're, if you're exercising and you're eating the right amount of protein, carbs, and, and uh, fats, and your insulin, insulin receptor sensitivity, it's another huge risk. So those are three simple tests. Actually, Actually, Joe, the people that go in and see their cardiologist and get lipid levels and uh, blood sugar levels, all the the risk factors for heart disease are very similar to the risk factors for cancer. So if you've got an elevated glucose, uh, elevated lipids, and an elevated CRP, we think the CRP is a pretty good tumor marker. And so you, those are things you need to work on and work on your, your level of inflammation. There's a really nice new book out now called uh, Anti-Cancer by Dr. David Sargon Schreiber. And he has a beautiful chapter on, on how what you eat modulates your level of inflammation. And so just for people becoming aware of their CRP and learning how to eat better and take better care of themselves in order to lower the CRP, that can make a huge difference right there. Yeah, and in addition to cancer and heart disease, there's two other diseases that the same indicators will be give you risk factors for, which is diabetes. One in four people have it. And the upcoming epidemic, which is losing your brain and your mind, which is Alzheimer's. And the projections are one in three people will have that in the next few decades. So, And all four of those major disease categories are related to excessive inflammation. And, and I wrote a little book on inflammation, which basically showed that the major factor that's causing an excess of inflammation in modern times is the diet. Uh, we, we, the, the modern diet is 20 times more inflammatory than the, uh, the hunter-gatherer type diet. Yeah, so that's clearly a key indication. And, you know, another element that I think has not gotten a lot of uh, press, uh, but I'm really recently exploring and, and really haven't talked about it too much in a site, is something called earthing where you're grounding yourself to the earth, uh, either ideally when you're sleeping or certainly in your work environment, uh, because then you're, the, the earth is able to pass these free electrons and get rid of that inflammation. And, and Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who's probably the leading natural cardiologist in the country, has done a lot of work in this area and has actually shown it massively improves platelet aggregation and decreases the blood clotting, uh, limits the blood clotting, or, optimizes the blood clotting ability of the blood, which is why most people have strokes and heart attacks is because they get a blood clot, which is related to the inflammation. So a lot of basic things. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm beginning, I know what your experience is with earthing, but personally I've been using it for a while and I just became, I've known about it for about five, six years, but I recently became convinced that it's, it's valid. And my concerns about uh, sort of using it as an antenna for gathering negative EMFs were not uh, uh, valid. And we're going to be recommending it in the near future. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. The other thing that I, that's come up in the whole IV vitamin C arena is that um, one of the causes for cancer is decreased oxygen utilization. And 
it's interesting to me that uh, that a lot of the therapies that are used for cancer actually uh, are using oxidants, uh, intracellular oxidants, uh, because vitamin C at high dosages creates more of the hydroxyl radical. Uh, Dr. Frank Schellenberger is using ozone therapy as a treatment for cancer patients. He, he has developed a way of measuring ATP utilization, and he says every cancer patient he's checked has very low ATP levels. And so when you use an oxidant, you improve your transformation of NADH to NAD. And NAD is absolutely necessary at the cellular level in order to make ATP. And, and if you have adequate amounts of ATP, then your cells can generate the antioxidant enzymes that you need to control the excessive oxidation that sets up the inflammatory response and the whole cascade of events that lead towards cancer. So things like uh, exercise or any th or, uh, exercise with oxygen therapy, anything that can improve your utilization of oxygen may be actually an anti-cancer approach. Excellent. So uh, one of the other areas that people uh, believe there may be an indication for and are actually using it, and I'm wondering if you can comment on this, is the use of uh, uh, IV vitamin C or oral vitamin C to chelate out heavy metals or for detoxing. And uh, what is your experience with that? Yeah, uh, well, that's, this is pretty well covered in uh, Dr. Levy's book, Curing the Incurable. He covers about 10 different major toxins that vitamin C will help to neutralize. And in my talk on the IV vitamin C protocol for, uh, for cancer patients, uh, remember that I mentioned that cancer is due to sustained injury. Well, if you've got to remove the cause, if you hope to get over the cancer. And so very often, heavy metal toxicity is a major cause of cancer. It reduces ATP formation. It, uh, it interferes with enzyme functioning within cells. So if you can remove, oh, the other big thing we're finding out is that heavy metals uh, reduce your body's ability to spontaneously generate adult stem cells. So if you want to promote healing within the body, you, you have to do everything you can to detoxify. And so IV vitamin C is a mild chelator as well as it helps your detoxification systems in the body uh, and restores glutathione functioning and things like that. Excellent. I recently read, met a uh, surgical oncologist who works out of Washington, D.C. who was using uh, infrared saunas uh, in conjunction with interestingly, a uh, high dose of niacin uh, to yeah. serve as a lipolysis too, because most of the toxins are stored in the fat. About, right. About, no, I agree with about that. About 101. Uh, and he was doing pre and post fat biopsies to, to monitor the effectiveness, and he was seeing extraordinary results. He actually had a, uh, an $8 million grant from the Department of Defense to treat uh, uh, Gulf War veterans and 9-11 uh, victims and was seeing really impressive results, but uh, so I think that would be another point. And, and so he used, he used the, vitamin, the high dose niacin up to five grams, you know, working up slow yeah. and with the sauna and actually exercising before to stimulate the lymphatics and get it out. So it was seeing right. pretty yeah. impress, impressive results. So uh, I agree. With yeah, if you're gonna treat cancer, you can't rely upon one modality, even though we do kind of focus on IV vitamin C at our clinic. We basically are measuring nutrient levels. We're 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 having people re-examine what they're eating. Uh, we're encouraging detoxification strategies, regular exercise, adequate sleep, uh, uh, improving uh, interpersonal relationships. All of this can have a bearing on your your outcome in cancer. Great, and uh, I guess you know a real common one that traditionally, of course, people have used vitamin C is for the common cold. You know, I've been promoting uh, high-dose vitamin D if you haven't been using it before as a one-time dose, but I just think a combination will be good. So, I mean, what are your uh, most effective strategies for incorporating vitamin C? From what you mentioned earlier, it sounds like an every hour uh, use of the vitamin C supplement would be useful if you can integrate that into your lifestyle, but rather than taking one dose once a day or even twice a day, you're going to get better results if you, if you, if you uh, have a more, lower dose more frequently. Yeah, you're going to get uh, higher sustained blood levels. And if you're starting to come down with a cold, then I would I would recommend uh, anywhere from one to four grams every hour until you get, 
you know, loose stools, and very often you can head off a cold that way. And, and then I also use uh, 50,000 units of vitamin D3 uh, one or, you know, once or twice a day for a couple of days if, if you, if you want to try to stop a cold in its tracks. Yeah, the earlier you start, the better, I'm sure. Do you find that those doses that uh, it makes any difference if you're using a vitamin C with bioflavonoids? Uh, or uh, a powder that you would put in, or if it's a, if it's that, if it's if it's if the type of powder like sodium ascorbate versus you know some of the other mineral ascorbates may make a difference. Dr. Gary Gordon has come up with a uh, what he calls a tightly bound sodium ascorbate powder that incorporates some D-ribose and MSM, and I I've been using a lot of that lately, and I've found that people can take a lot more of it than they can regular uh, buffered C. Or uh, or ascorbic acid, but you know it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. I think ascorbic acid is fine if you put it, if you you know if you have to put it in a little bit of water with a little bit of juice in it, and that'll cut the taste. And as long as it doesn't upset your stomach, if you do a small amount frequently, you should be fine. With the with the juice, like a lemon from a lemon or a lime, which you have much less yeah. fructose and be you know, right. so that that'd be the best that, way to do it. Yeah, would that yeah, that buffer it essentially? Yeah, it will, will to a certain extent. Yeah, it will to a certain extent, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like lemon and limes. In fact, uh, it's sort of our trick for using vegetable juice, which is another powerful intervention, just juicing vegetables, because we all need, you know, five, six, seven servings of vegetables a day, and how many of us are doing that? So if you if you integrate a vegetable juice into your program, you can do that, but the lime makes a huge, or a lemon makes a huge difference in, in making it a palatable. Right, right. I think that's a great idea. So... Doctor uh, Dr. Abram Hoffer, who was Dr. Reardon's good friend, uh, actually did a thing with about a, I don't know, it was up to a thousand patients. This was years ago where he had them go up to as high of an amount of vitamin C as they could take, uh, niacin, beet complex, selenium, vitamin E, and vitamin D. And this oral program he found dramatically improved survivability in cancer patients. Excellent. So business. some of these oral uh, synergisms, like I call it redox synergy, if you use these things together, you're going to get a lot better effects than if you use just one thing alone. Yeah. So I, a lot of times, uh, what I've noticed after three decades in health is that it, it, you know, the more you know and really understand about the truth of this, the matter, it's it really it's pretty simple. It, you know, it's back to the basics. It's not rocket science. And really, and that's very encouraging for those who are listening because it really empowers us to understand that we can, as a consumer, as a patient who didn't go to medical school, really take control of our health and integrating these very simple and most of the time inexpensive and virtually in most cases without side effects. Treatments that's right. That can, that's that right. can have radical improvements in your health, that you don't have to rely on these dangerous and expensive medications that can wipe you out prematurely. So um, I've often told patients that your cells really don't care what diagnosis the doctor is giving the problem. They only want to make sure they have the key nutrients that they need to run the metabolism of, that, that cells have, and then they want to make sure that the, 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 the toxins that interfere, the anti-nutrients that interfere with uh, their functioning, get those out. And if you do those two things, you can achieve a very high level of health. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're in agreement with that because it seems it seems to make a lot of sense. So uh, I guess we're we're at the end of the interview, and if you just want to like make any co closing comments and emphasize any key points, and then we'll we'll uh, additionally ask for specific follow-up information or content information if someone wants to find what you're doing and more about you. Okay, yeah, I just just to let people know that uh, intravenous vitamin C, in my mind, is the rediscovery of uh, of an innate healing ability that all organisms use when they're stressed, sick, infected, or injured. And, and you know, IV vitamin C has been used in burn patients. It's been used in chronic infection patients. It's been used for depression. There's just so many things that respond well to intravenous vitamin C. This is for people that have a serious illness. Now, if you're well and you want to stay well, you don't have to do IV vitamin C. You can Though I do have a friend of mine in Japan who every member, every sibling, I think he's got like eight siblings and they all have cancer. He's doing a 25 gram IV vitamin C every week to prevent the cancer that everyone else in his family seems to be getting. 
So you can use it preventatively, though I think uh, good lifestyle, good habits of health, good nutrition works just as well if, if, you, uh, if, if, you can, uh, if you can stay well that way. But if you do get sick, uh, it's a very powerful tool that I think is underutilized by most doctors. Okay, great. And again, if you can highlight the resources that uh, people could uh, obtain more information or learn about you and what you're doing in your clinic. Well, we, uh, the, the Reardon Clinic uh, has a very nice website. And then if you click under research, there, there's two pathways you can go down. One, it has all of our research articles that we've published, over 100 different articles that we've published. And then on the, on the other side of it, it has the Reardon IVC protocol and some, some basic information and videos about the RECNAC research project that was undertaken in the 90s that uh, is very helpful to people. And then the other resource is the healthhunteronline.org, and you click on videos, and there's one called How Vitamin C Fights Cancer. That's me talking about the uh, mechanism of how it works. And then the other one is Dr. Glenn Highland, IVC chemotherapy, radiation, are they compatible, where he gives a very compelling lecture to a group of scientists about the how not only are they compatible, but they are uh, synergistic and improve quality of life. Well, I thank you for those resources. I thank you for your time today and helping us better understand this really powerful resource that we can easily incorporate into our lifestyle and, and use more aggressively if serious illness does develop to a very good benefit for anyone seeking to, to apply that. So thank you again and uh, best of luck you, with, your, with your work out there. And, and, and thank you, Joe, for all the work you do to, to get this message out.